Welcome to this first lecture about cellular automata. Cellular automata can for example be used for spatial simulations of how a disease is spread between people in a population, or how the HIV virus is spread between cells in the body. This lecture is divided into three videos. In the first video, we'll discuss the basics of cellular automata and have a look at the game of life model. In the second video, we learn about probabilistic cellular automata that can be used to simulate the spread of a disease. We will also have a look at lattice-free simulations. In the last video, I will show you some basic R code so that you can implement your first cellular automata. Note that you can find some basic R code for cellular automata on my homepage. To build a cellular automaton model, we need a lattice, also called a grid, where the cells in the lattice have a certain state. The states are updated based on some rules every discrete time step. As an example, the following cellular automaton is defined by a 3x3 lattice, which means that it consists of 9 cells, or 9 elements. Each cell in this lattice has a certain state. For example, this cell has a state of 1, whereas this cell has a state of 0. The value 1 could for example represent an infected person whereas the value zero could represent a healthy person. In this example, we therefore have seven healthy and two infected individuals. Note that the state can represent anything you like to model. Let's have a closer look at the states. A state is usually coded by a number. To generate a nice plot of the lattice, the numbers can be represented by a certain color. In this case, the ones are represented by a red color whereas the zeros are represented by a blue color. For example, a state may represent a dead or a live cell, where we code dead cells as zeros and live cells as ones. The states may also represent, for example, empty space, or that the space is occupied by something. We can also have more than two states, for example, the states susceptible, infected and recovered, if we like to simulate how a virus is spread in a population. Each cell in the lattice has neighbors. For example, in a von Neumann neighborhood, the cells have four neighbors. One to the north, west, south, and east. In the so-called Moore neighborhood, the cells have instead eight neighbors, which also includes neighbors to the northwest, southwest, southeast, and northeast. One can also consider a second or a third layer as a neighborhood. In this case, a second layer in the von Neumann neighborhood is shown. We'll now have a look at the rules that are used to update the states every time step. Let's have a look at some simple rules based on the von Neumann neighborhood where each cell may have four neighbors. The first rule states that if a cell has a state of 0 and at least one of its neighbors has a state of 1, the cell changes its state to 1. The second rule states that if a cell has a state of 1 and at least two of its neighbors have a state of 1, the cell changes its state to 0. Let's apply these rules on the following lattice. The cell in the top left corner has a state of 1 and its two neighbors have a state of 0. This means that the cell does not change its state when we update the lattice according to the second rule. This cell has a state of 0 and the neighbor to its left has a state of 1. According to the first rule, the cell therefore changes state from 0 to 1. This cell has a state of 0 and no neighbors with a state of 1, which means that it does not change its state. This cell has a state of 0 and one neighbor of state 1, which means that it will change state from 0 to 1 and so forth. Once we have updated all the states, the lattice will look like this. If you now update this lattice, the states will be updated to this. If we continue to update the lattice, we will end up with a pattern that repeats itself. These two patterns will be repeated over and over. Let's use the software tool to simulate how the pattern changes over time. 
Note how the pattern stabilizes after four cycles. We'll now have a look at the classic Game of Life model, which was developed by John Conway in the 1970s. This model consists of four rules and two states. Each cell has either a state of 1, which represents a live cell, or 0, which represents a dead cell. Note that we will here use the more neighborhood, which means that a cell can now have 8 neighbors. The first rule states that a live cell with less than two live neighbors dies due to underpopulation. The second rule states that a live cell with more than three live neighbors dies due to overpopulation. It is too crowded to stay alive. The third rule states that a live cell with two or three live neighbors stays alive. The last rule states that a dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes alive, which could represent reproduction. Okay, so let's apply these rules on the following lattice to see how it changes over time. The cell in the top left corner is a dead cell. Since it has only two live neighbors, it stays dead according to the fourth rule. The next cell is a live cell with less than two live neighbors. So it dies according to the first rule. The next cell is a dead cell with only two live neighbors. So it stays dead. The next cell is a dead cell with exactly three live neighbors. Which means that it becomes alive according to rule number four. The live cell in the center has two live neighbors. Which means that it stays alive according to the third rule. Once we have updated all cells in the lattice according to the rules, the new pattern looks like this. If you now apply these rules again on this lattice, it will change pattern to this. These two patterns will be repeated over and over. I will here use the software R to simulate the game of life. The grey color represents dead cells, whereas the green color represents live cells. So, if you start the simulation, we see that the pattern starts to change. Note how the pattern is repeated. However, if we use the same rules but start with the following pattern of 10 live cells, we will get a complete different pattern that oscillates over time. Note how the pattern is repeating itself after 15 cycles. If you start with the following pattern, we'll get a so-called glider where the pattern is moving. However, what should we do when the pattern reaches the edge of the lattice? The edges of our lattice could represent a real barrier, which means that a cell in the edge has fewer neighbors compared to the cells in the center. For example, the cell in the top left corner has only three neighbors whereas this cell has five neighbors. Since the cells at the edges of the lattice have different number of neighbors, this will give rise to certain edge effects. If we imagine our lattice to be a subspace in a bigger world, we could use a periodic boundary condition, which is like an infinite lattice. A periodic boundary condition means that a cell at the edge of the lattice has a neighbor at the opposite side. For example, this cell has the following eight neighbors, where three of its neighbors are on the opposite side of the lattice. The same is also true for this cell, where its three neighbors to the left are on the opposite side of the lattice. Let's simulate the glider again. Note that we will appear on the opposite side of the lattice when we apply periodic boundaries. In all our previous examples, we have used a synchronous update of the lattice, which means that the states of all cells are updated at the same time. By using a synchronous update, make sure that all states are kept fixed during one time step. This can be achieved by using a temporary lattice where we save the new states. For example, if you update the following lattice according to the rules in the Game of Life model, 
and use real edges as boundaries for our lattice, the top left cell has then three neighbors. This cell stays dead since it only has two live neighbors. This cell dies since it has only one live neighbor. However, note that we do this change in a temporary lattice and not in the lattice that we are currently reading in. Once we have updated all cells of the temporary lattice, we replace the old lattice by the temporary lattice so that we get a new updated lattice. In such a way, we update all cells at the same time. We'll now have a look at asynchronous updating. By using an asynchronous update, each cell is updated instantly, which means that no temporary lattice is needed. Let's say that we would update the cells in the following order, from left to right. If you use asynchronous update instead of synchronous update in a game of life model with edges, all cells will die after the first cycle. The reason why this is happening is that this cell will directly be set to zero, since it has less than two live neighbors. When we come to this cell, it now has only two live neighbors left, because its northeast neighbor has already died. It therefore stays dead in comparison to the case when we use a synchronous update where this cell has three live neighbors. The cell in the middle will also die because it now has less than two live neighbors. When using a synchronous update, one therefore usually uses a stochastic process when the cells are selected so that the order of the selection does not influence the simulation. In the next lecture we'll have a look at the probabilistic cellular automata that can be used to simulate the spread of a virus in a population or between cells in the body. We will also learn how to simulate movements of objects in the lattice and how to perform lattice-free simulations. See you in the next lecture and thanks for watching.